have this uh, this question that I assume that you have also when you saw the presentation from Marta. Do we actually need a new standard in power control? Aren't we fine with what we have already? I'll go quick through some of the slides, not to keep you too far away from your lunch, because I think basically it should start now. Uh, but I have some important, some important slides I think you, you would like to see as well. So already we know that it's a very prevalent virus. It's basically everywhere. And vaccines uh, induce uh, quite a good protection in utilizing antibodies, um, mainly about the, the disease and also the clinical signs. Still now and then we see, we see uh, failures in vaccination and also uh, back in time as a practitioner, I've seen uh, failures, so still small breaks of parvo in, in herds. Um, it could be due to, to too early vaccination because uh, maternal antibodies actually last quite long. So we have to wait until uh, five months at least to, to vaccinate the gills. Um, we also sometimes see errors in, in vaccination programs, as uh, Tanya mentioned. Uh, I've seen cases where the storage of the vaccine was, either the vaccine was frozen simply uh, because the fridge was too cold, but I've also seen cases where the, 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 vac the, um, the fridge was not even plugged into the electricity. Um, and the worst case was that I, I went to a very well-organized farm and they showed me their new storage room for all uh, pharmaceuticals, both vaccines and uh, also antibiotics, and they were very proud of it. But it was just a room without any uh, cooling or any heating. So it was, uh, yeah, that was a disaster. Anyway, so, so that's common, and you see it out now and then. Um, but then, more recent, uh, we have seen also lack of vaccine uh, protection uh, due to some uh, new field isolates. And uh, Marta already uh, showed this, uh, that clearly shows that there is an evolution of the uh, uh, power viruses over the years. Um, the vaccines that we have available are mainly uh, uh, made from these older uh, isolates. And then we have this, uh, the new clusters and the vaccine that we have developed comes from the, the cluster D here. And these new clusters, they are uh, increasing in prevalence uh, around Europe. There are some uh, reports on that. So what, what we see, and now when we talk about recent publications in PAVO, uh, <laughs> you'd say, how recent uh, how is recent? So, so in PERS, we, we maybe think if we have a publication that is older than five years, we almost don't consider it anymore. Uh, as, and, but in Pavo, everything is a bit slower. And you saw also here, I don't know if you could see the years here though. So we're, now we're talking about a scale on the x-axis going from 1964 to 2014. If I showed that in purse, you would, you would laugh. So it's, everything's a bit uh, slower here. Um, but this 27A that was uh, first detected by Truian in Germany, it seems to, to be spreading to, to other countries as well. And some of these new clusters also seem to, to be more virulent uh, than the previous uh, uh, strains, and they also uh, seem to be uh, have a different uh, picture when it comes to immunity. So when we are talking about the neutralizing activity against these. This is uh, some numbers I got from uh, Lars-Erik Larsen from the National uh, Technical University of Denmark. And these are, they, they did uh, quite some sequencing uh, or they started to do some sequencing, especially because they, when they looked into uh, submissions for uh, reproductive cases, they saw a shift uh, from 2014 to 2015. Um, so what you see here that they have between yeah, 25 and, and 70 submissions every year. And until 2014, there was quite few uh, PCR positive for PAVO, uh, between 2.5 and, and uh, 5 or 6%. 
And then from 14 to 15, there was a change. So all of a sudden, um, there was about here in, in 15, 11.4%. PCR positive to Parvo increased in 16 to 21% and 9%, 19%. And then they start to do the sequencing of that, and I will not show that data because this is, is not published yet, and they're going to, to publish, so uh, I'm not allowed to, to, to show that. Uh, but you will see that later on. But the, the thing is that um, the data from these uh, show that there's a change uh, in the serotypes, and they also detect uh, this uh, 27A, and when they look at that and sequence that, it's, it's completely... Uh, um, similar to the one that Turin detected in Germany in 2001. So it seems like uh, these new uh, strains are spreading and they are also uh, creating some, some uh, mummified fetuses in cases. So that's one reason that we might need a new, a new protection. Uh, as Marta told us, uh, we believe that we are actually with, with the new vaccine, Reposite Powerflex, addressing exactly the right target here. So we are addressing the VP2, and we put it into the bacula virus backbone and express it uh, and put it uh, together with Imprint Flex, exactly the same technique as we have used for Circoflex, as he told. So that we, with the same amount of antigen, we are actually able to create a high immunogenic response. So you have seen this already. And uh, just the key features here, it's for active immunization of gills and sows from uh, five, five months of age to protect uh, the progeny against uh, transplacental infection. Um, the onset of immunity, yeah, that's from the, the beginning of the uh, gestation period. And then the duration of immunity, six months. You saw the duration of immunity study that Marta showed you. Um, it's a very safe vaccine. It can be mixed with per CU, uh, and it, you, we use this new uh, filter technology. So compared to, uh, to older vaccines, uh, we see that we have, in the older vaccines, we have inactivated full virus uh, particles, whereas in the PowerFlex, we are using this new bacterial virus express system. And you know that uh, is exactly the same as we, we used for the creation of Engelberg CircoFlex. So if we if we put it into that perspective, I don't know if it makes sense for you, but but let's see if if like in PCV2 we have some old techniques and we have some new techniques. In the old techniques, we have vaccines like uh, Circovac and Suvaxin, which has killed whole cell viral antigen, and um, they have the single viral capsid protein. Whereas in Circoflex, we use this uh, new bacterial virus expressed VLP system. Uh, where we in the in the circle uh, flex, we're using the off two as the immunogenic part, and then it's concentrated and we purify the antigen. In the Parvo vaccines, uh, in comparison, they are all again these uh, killed whole cell viral antigen, and you have the capsid protein that you actually get when you kill kill this. And here we're using with the Parvo, we're using the VP two, again concentrated in uh, as VLPs and purified. Both uh, here, uh, so we have now, with this we have created a vaccine that is uh, not viricidal, so it can be mixed with the, with the PERS vaccine. So that lead me to, so that was, I think, one or two good reasons uh, why we need a new uh, vaccine. Um, then we wanted to know how is it in comparison to other vaccines in the market? Uh, so we did a comparative study in uh, saint Bolba in France. Uh, we compared it to uh, two other uh, currently uh, available vaccines in the market. And the study set up was basically the same as Marta showed for, for the other studies, the duration of immunity studies. So vaccination uh, two times of three to four weeks apart. Evaluating the safety, um, day zero, four, uh, the, the minus, uh, so the day before uh, the vaccination, the day of vaccination, and four days and later, local reactions and rectal temperatures. 
Then we had the insemination, day uh, 42, and then the challenge at uh, day 40. And then we necropsy the, the gills at day 90, exactly as uh, Marta showed. We f confirmed first that the, the gills were serin negative. Then they had a serin conversion after the vaccination and then the varemia after challenge we were looking for. When we looked at the safety were for the one of the vaccines, we had 21% of the animals with some swelling between 3 and 10 centimeters. One of the other vaccines uh, was 50% of the animals with a swelling. And then the riverside power flex, we had no, no local reactions. We had a, a negative control group. And what you see here is that the challenge actually worked uh, extremely well. There were five uh, gills in the control group. And uh, all the fetuses that were collected here, you can see the numbers. Uh, and then you can see uh, the fetuses from uh, the left to the right as they were placed in the horn. And uh, all the fetuses here were mummified. One of these animals, uh, the last one you see, there was no, no uh, fetuses found at the necropsy, which was interesting because it, the, we did ultrasound of these gills as well uh, before the challenge. And at the ultrasound, it was pregnant. It was uh, found pregnant, but yeah, it did deliver anything. So some, some fetus were lost between uh, the day before challenge and until day 90. And I have no explanation for that. So we can say that the challenge here was validated because 100% of the fetus in the negative control group were mummified. Now to the, the figuracy results. You see them uh, again in the same manner. So you have the three groups of vaccines here. And you can see the, the number of uh, normal piglets, normal piglets in the, in the second column. And then you have the placement in the uterus, uh, how they were. And uh, the number of normal piglets in the ribside power flex groups were 13.1, were 10.6 in the second, uh, the other vaccine group, and in the third vaccine group, it was 11.7. If we look then at the abnormal fetuses, uh, in the same row, you see here that in the Reposite Power Flux group, we had 3.5% abnormal fetuses. In the second vaccine group, it was 2.6% abnormal and 11.3%. And when we look into the percentage of sow with a lower liter size, so low liter size here was considered as uh, gills delivering less than 11 piglets. That was 12% in the Reposite Powerflex group. It was uh, 56 in the first va other vaccine group and 22% uh, in the third group. So uh, that was interesting, a low number. Um, when we look at the, the PCR, uh, we could see that that was completely uh, also uh, prevented in the Reposite Power Group. And finally, the PCR of the fetus. So you saw already that uh, the control group, we had 100% uh, PCR positive in the normal um, in the abnormal fetus. A Reposite Power Group, 0.4%. Erosync Pavo, uh, 0%, and the last vaccine, 0.5%. So I think we can, we can say that they, there's an indication that it could be needed uh, with some other protection uh, when we talk about uh, some of the newer strains. And then finally, that leads me to uh, our suggestion for the vaccination protocol in the future. Um, and I'll see if I can, I can explain what our thoughts are here. We tried to make it simple, but I, I don't know. We'll see. So first of all, we have the guilt acclimatization time. Um, so we put it up as a linear. Then you see the line. I don't know if I have a point. I can see. Maybe if I'm lucky. 
here. So this one is indicating we have the gelts coming into the sow, uh, sows. They are bred, and then you have one reproductive cycle here. Uh, they go back in, into the next reproductive cycle, and so on. So you see the four different reproductive cycles here. Then we suggest that we change our vaccination or against ARI to that, do that still in a cycle-based. Uh, if we believe that we need some of the ARI to protect also uh, the piglets, so not only the sows, but also the offspring, we, we believe that it's better to vaccinate before farrowing than after farrowing. At least if you want to deliver some of the antibodies to the, to the fetus or to the piglets, we need to increase uh, the maternal antibodies before farrowing because after it's too late. So that's our suggestion uh, to do that cycle-based. Then we have the PowerFlex vaccine. I have to press the right button here. Uh, so we, we have, need to have the two uh, initial vaccinations of the gilts and then every six months a mass vaccination with the Repocyte PowerFlex. We have uh, uh, safety studies showing that we can use uh, Repocyte PowerFlex at all stages of the station, and that's actually going to be published uh, now very soon. Then uh, we also want to combine with the Repocyte per CU, and you know we can put that into the same syringe. So, for example, here at the second time where we use uh, in the same mass vaccination scheme, um, but Repocyte PowerFlex is uh, registered to be vac you vaccinate in mass vaccination every three to four months, and uh, PowerFlex is every six months. So, therefore, we suggest that in every second time you vaccinate with Repocyte Repos Repos EU, you combine it with uh, PowerFlex. Does it make sense? And then you could think of also protecting against the, the other reproductive disease that uh, that Tani was talking about here, uh, Circoflex. And so you could add that, uh, for example, at the interest of the guilt accumulation. I think it's a good idea already to immunize against PERS here at the beginning. So every second time when you do not combine the PERS U with the PowerFlex, you could uh, vaccinate against at the same time with Ingelbeck Circoflex. So that's that's our suggestion uh, for a vaccination protocol with that new vaccine. I think we can say that we, we have uh, the new innovative standard in control of reproductive disease. We developed Circoflex uh, years ago. Now we have uh, the power virus using exactly the same system, was uh, developed in the same way, and we also have this uh, new Perceive U uh, vaccine. Um, so with that, uh, I hope you at least created some interest for, for this new power vaccine.